All right, good afternoon, everyone. We'll be starting now. Thank you for um, joining us up. Um, I hope you can see us clearly. Hope you can see us clearly. I'm happy to see everyone. Uh, we can see the people from different parts of the country. I can see somebody from Boko. I can see people from Lagos. Um, so we'll be starting now. My name is Dr. Iseko Iseko. And with me is um, Dr. Olamik Olamik. Nice to always be here. Um, we are reaching you from cardio care, more to special in Abuja. Um, let me see our studios, but <laughs> <laughs> but really it's in the hospital conference room. So we'll be sharing from our own experience and we'll be sharing our continual professional development with you. For doctors, do remember that you can get uh, 1.5 CME points from this activity and it will be mailed to you immediately after it for those that attend for at least 60% of the time. So um, if, if you leave before time, you may not qualify. If you only spend 10 minutes, you may not qualify. So please get ready for a nice time. We'll be talking about resistant hypertension. And uh, we have close to 60 people. We also have representatives from Sevier Pharmaceuticals who will make a short presentation later on as we go on with it. So, um, are you ready? Yes, I just <laughs> want to repeat our people I hope it's not too late to say happy new year because this yes, is yes. our first webinar yes. in, the, in the in the new year. Yes, 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 so yes. I, I, it's still in order to say happy new year to our, yes, to our listeners and uh, happy everybody. new year. We have a lot of fantastic uh, <laughs> uh, topics lined up. This year is going to be fire fire, and I expect that everyone should really benefit the most. Okay, so um, we'll go straight away uh, into the topic. We want to make sure that we spend just the right amount of time, not more than 60 minutes, as much as possible. Um, so today we'll be talking about resistant hypertension. Dr. Lale will be the key discussant, and I'll be moderating, Dr. Seko is my name. We are both physician cardiologists at CardioCare, most special hospital in Abuja. And uh, CardioCare is a member of the Dimi Hospitals, um, who are celebrating 40 years. 40 years yesterday, so February 9th, 1982, um, Cardio uh, Limi Hospital Group was founded in Zaria, Kaduna State, and thereafter has grown into all the hospitals you are seeing. Our vision essentially is to empower everyone through healthcare, and that's training, research, and delivery. So and that's one of this. This is one of the opportunity to be able to improve on our healthcare delivery through training, sharing of knowledge, exactly, and other things. So we are sharing from our own experience and from our world of knowledge. These are the living hospitals, and like I said, 1982, so we are 40 this year. So we are collecting gifts, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, and this is cardio care where we practice. Um, cardio care is a hospital that is focused on inter, inter, internal medicine, which consists of interventional cardiology, cardiac surgery, cardiology, endo, stroke, you know, anything that's complex um, is essentially we do it in, in cardio care. Um, so um, some of the things we do include pacemakers, yes. devices, CRTs, CRTs coronary yeah. ambulance, yeah. and all of that. So we do quite a number of fantastic things that people don't have to travel abroad for anymore. So we are really happy that we are a, a pace setter in that area. So we offer service, we are, we are bridging that gap. We are yes. close to you and at a fraction of the price, of the price that you spend traveling, traveling at large. Okay, so we'll go straight into it. Our seminar, the reason why we are holding this seminar or webinar is for you to understand the condition, for you to detect it, treat it, and prevent complications that will arise from it. So. Our goal is that once people learn more and do more, Nigeria can be better. So yes. our contribution to national development is by doing this for all healthcare workers. And we've been doing this for quite a while now. Um, so close to five years, we've been doing different forms of educational 
programs just to reach out to the healthcare worker. So straight, our case. We have a 65 year old man. Yes. This is a real life case, by the way. It's mm -hmm. not uh, made up. Presented on an account of constant elevated blood pressure. He was diagnosed with hypertension 20 years ago. No, he has some history of abnormal renal function, and he's presently on the He's on labetalol. He's on losartan from the source of referral. The review of system is not significant. He doesn't smoke. Doesn't take alcohol. Um, examination findings essentially were okay, but you can see the pulse was 68 per minute was regular. The blood pressure 160 over 80, and the heart sounds were normal. No carotid or renal breeds were found. So we'll launch a poll now. Have, if, take a look again at this test presentation, and then you will answer the question that follows. Okay? So 65-year-old man, blood pressure is 160, 80. He's on three drugs, nifedipine, labetalone, and, and losartan, and he has some abnormal background renal dysfunction. So can we answer the poll? Question A, patient has this type of tension. B, you should continue his present medication and review in four weeks. C, add algorithms. D, give sedatives to help people control. E, add directly to treatment. So can we um, answer? We want to assess our baseline knowledge. Our baseline knowledge before we go on with the presentation. So let's, let's answer, answer. Participate, participate. Don't worry, it's anonymous. We don't know what you are picking. <laughs> so if you pick the wrong answer, nobody will, will hold it against you. You can close your eyes and just choose any of the if, if you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of this presentation, you would most definitely know what to do and how to approach it. Okay? So about 40% of people have, have uh, participated. Click, 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 choose. Don't worry, it's anonymous. We don't know what you picked. Okay. All right. I think we'll stop the poll in five seconds. Five, four, click. If you have not clicked, okay. And 52% have clicked, so we can end the poll now. And I, I think it's, we, we, are, we are very right and apt to our choosing the, to discuss this. Yeah. Uh, Yes, yes. The response you can see the response people. is varied. <laughs> yes, varied. So we'll not, we'll not answer the question yet. Uh, we'll, but look at all the answers. Thirty-four percent said this. Um, well, okay. When we go through it now, you will get the answer. The post is showing. Okay, stop here. Oops. All right, so this is the outline of what we'll be discussing. So Dr. Olaleko, a lot of people said that this patient has this kind of hypertension. hypertension. Um, so what is this hypertension? Okay, thanks for the opportunity again. So we, we say a patient has a resistant hypertension when a patient is on three Antihypertensive medication with complementary action. Okay. At the maximum dose or the maximum tolerable dose. dose and does not achieve control when you measure the BP either by office measurements or by out of office measurements. So the key word here is the blood pressure is not controlled, not up to target. Yeah. The patient is on at least three medications with complementary action. This will define again when we are doing, going in depth. But the key, another keyword is out of these three med medications, at least one, one must be a diuretic. Okay, so if we now go back to that, our, our guests, yes. our patients. So the history said the the patient is on nifedipine, labetalol, and losartan. So just looking at the medication, whether it's maximum dose or not, this patient does not qualify as, as resistant hypertension, irrespective of what the level of the blood pressure is. Okay, so we essentially blood pressure is greater than 140, 90 than that. Yes. Is. 
The patient is on three drugs that are complementing each other. Yes. And one of, them. one of them is a diuretic. If despite this patient is still having uncontrolled, we say that it's resistant. resistant type wow, 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 wow. So um essentially, which are these are the three drugs? So, yes. So go ahead. Let's so they, they, from studies, I said that these three drugs that we said complementing each other at least should be a calcium channel blocker. Okay. A long acting calcium channel blocker. Correct. So, not the verapamil, not no, the diazem. So, that's one. Two, an A and B okay. or an ACE inhibitor, okay. any of the two. So, it could be Ramipril, it could be Valsatan, Candesatan. Uh, okay. I, I don't think people are still using Catoplil, mm. <laughs> but Catoplil is, long, is not long acting okay. and a diuretic. And the reason for these three is one, like we said, they complement each other. Yes. Most of them are long acting. Yes. You, you can have them in combined pill to improve yes. adherence. Yes. Then they're still relatively cheap. Yeah. So these are the main reason why these three drugs are the most. Yes. So once you have these three drugs at the maximum tolerable doses and you're not achieving control, then you can now see this patient as a resistant hypertension. I, I hope that is very clear. So yeah, I think. If you have these three drugs, uh, and a lot of combinations are available. Yes. It's relatively cheap. Sometimes it's not, mm -hmm. uh, especially if it's branded. Um, it's easier to comply because it's one drug. Um, it's it's long-acting, and these are quite good drugs because they also have secondary cardiovascular disease yes. benefit. By using these drugs, they, in addition to bring out the blood pressure, they also reduce risk of stroke, yes. MI, heart you attacks. Know, renal protection effect, exactly. and all those other exactly. So the, the, the benefits goes beyond just BP control. So sometimes now people are supposedly on this drug. And we now say there is, is everybody, does everybody classify? Or are there some pseudo or <laughs> what do we call them? Okay, so when, when we look at this group, Despite the fact that they are on these three drugs, some people are not truly resistant. Exactly. So now we talked about combination pill improving adherence. You want to know if a patient, if you write a drug and the patient is not taking it. Yeah. So <laughs> will you say the patient is resistant because the patient has not even taken the drug? Maybe the patient could not afford the drug or something like that. So or, or the patient does not believe in the drug. Yes. So one. You have to rule out all those false resistant hypertension okay. that we call the pseudo. Yeah. So if I look at the medication adherence, then make sure have you measured the blood pressure well. Some cases as the patient is entry, but I sit down, sit down, let's <laughs> I mean, let me quickly measure you. So you will get a falsely elevated blood pressure and you will think the patient is not doing well. So there are a number of reasons so, yes. that are making it the blood pressure is showing to be high. Or it may not really be high. It may yes. be that you're measuring it wrongly. It may be that the patient has not even fulfilled that criteria of taking their drug for You know, and uh, other things. So we'll talk about that as we go on. Um, so um, we're talking about there are two types of uh, resistant hypertension. Can you can you walk us through them? Yes, we, we're just trying to simplify it because. The, from the definition, we said three drugs. Yeah. So another definition I says if the blood pressure is controlled with four more than four drugs, but to make it simple, we say someone has an uncontrolled resistant hypertension if the first definition is fulfilled that patient yeah. is on three medication and still, and, and still on control. Then you now have some patients that they are on four medications now, yeah. and the BP is controlled. On yes. those four medications. Yes, hypertension, but they yes. need four drugs. But they need four drugs to control Correct. their blood pressure. So those are the controlled resistant hypertension. Oh. So you can broadly say uncontrolled resistant hypertension and controlled resistant. So automatically, as we are going through clinic now, we must be looking at and saying, okay, fine. There are a number of patients in our clinic, in our hospitals that we are managing that actually have controlled or uncontrolled resistant hypertension, yes. and we must act, you know, accordingly. So um, there are different ways to classify blood pressure. You know, there are people have asked, ah, they say blood pressure is now 1380. What do you think of that? The, the aim of doing this is, studies have shown that right after above blood pressure above 120 millimeters of mercury, systolic blood pressure, there has been facts to establish that the cardiovascular risk increases from that point. 
So what the American Act Association is advocating is, okay, let's bring down this cotton target so that we can actively be looking for all this cardiovascular uh, risk in our patients. They are not saying once you have a patient with 135 over 80, you should start treatment, treatment as in medical, as in drugs. They are saying, okay, pay close attention to this patient, look out for all these cardiovascular disease and complication, and let the patient start active lifestyle, lifestyle modification to reduce all these cardiovascular so once, once somebody is above 130, 80, for all intents and purposes, and for everybody listening to this webinar, even now or afterwards, and once somebody is 130, 80, take that patient to be hypertensive. Mm -hmm. Do all your full cardiovascular risk workup. Check their cholesterol, check their ECG, check their eyes, their retina, check their kidney function, and yeah, begin to you take your urine for protein. And if any of them is abnormal, you need to start some treatment. Yes. And if, if it's not abnormal, you need to start lifestyle treatment. They need to start something to prevent it. So if we begin to look at it from a different way, that is the whole idea of this. Yes, that is the whole, whole idea of that. So like how, how common is this type of tension now? When we bring all patients with attention on medication together, mm. between 10 to 13% of them have resistant hypertension after looking through all the factors released. But if, if, we, if we now use the lower cutoff of 138, <laughs> that prevalence is, is going to go up by about 4%. So, like we said, we're just trying to make sure that we take extra care because the group of patients that has this resistant hypertension, they, they have higher risk of having cardiovascular complications, even more than other colleagues with hypertension. Of course. So, that is why we're just trying to be more proactive by saying, let's look into okay. this and maybe bring down this cutoff and catch more so, people. Those people that have resistant hypertension, whether controlled or, or not, mm. they have two to six fold higher risk for MI, stroke, stroke and kidney disease. function, and kidney damage. So you need to work, you need to work very hard on them. I, I remember I had a young man a while ago, about five, seven years ago, and I told him very strongly about it. He had a, a resistant hypertension. And he did not, by the time I saw him four years after, it was a student disease, mm. you know. So it's something that all of us must take very into full cognizance. And begin to work. So it's quite important for us to know this subset of hypertension. Um, so can you tell us more about this, sir? So this is just showing us what, what we discussed that we can see that the true hypertension is just this small, about that 10% of the whole group of patients with uncontrolled hypertension. So if you look at the large, the, the larger picture. We we'll see this group of patients. This is the patient we present. This is where the patient belongs. Yeah, uncontrolled. Where uncontrolled, but the way the drugs are being combined, not Properly. adequate. So people talk about apparent treatment resistant hypertension. They just look at the number of drugs the patient is on and say, ah, on this drug, this drug, ah, this is resistant hypertension, which is not which is not true. Then we now have this group of sports. Okay, so which we is yes, which we look into, into because when the subgroup of patients with resistant hypertension were brought out after thorough examination, correct measurement of BP, they found out that even from that subgroup, about 30 percent of them were not, were really not truly resistant. were not truly resistant. So it's something that we need to painstakingly do. And another reason why we're looking at this is we just don't, so that we just don't give up on our patients. Yeah. That our patient is already on antihypertensive. What's the point of taking medication As without we achieving control and now having complications? So the job we're doing, we, we must do it well. Well, so sometimes, sometimes you have a doctor or a patient coming in and say, doctor, do you see that my blood pressure is all control. I did not sleep well last mm. night. Uh, and the doctor says, okay, let us continue with that. But those are things that we should be to consider. That patient you have, that his blood pressure is never controlled. Is it truly that, or is having resistant hypertension? That's what we should um, consider. So um, certain things, of course, are there particular patients that uh, uh, more likely to have resistant hypertension or characteristics that are more associated with? Yes. A patient, our initial with initially high blood pressure, very elevated blood pressure, 
that patient, you know, stand a very high risk of mm -hmm. having a resistant hypertension. Black, unfortunately, <laughs> anywhere, whether <laughs> here in America, oh my in developed country, we start a higher chance. Patient with left ventricular hypertrophy, and this is one of the reasons why ECG and echo is mandatory. Yeah, in because, everybody coming with yes, hypertension. Because the, that's already a sign of end organ damage. Left ventricular hypertrophy, chronic kidney disease, associated diabetes, then unfortunately female sex, then high intake of salt. So these are an obese patient. These are factors that have been identified from studies widespread studies that resistant hypertension is commoner in these people. Yeah. So that means when you have this characteristic in someone you are saying, even from, for the first time, then you must continue to look out for their blood pressure to make sure that they don't spend a long time in that group where you just have a Nigeria, Nigerians checks. are in this group of high dietary salt. Almost all our food has a very high, high salt. salt. So we are also, by definition also, Patients that are more likely to have this type of hypertension. This is why it's important that taking the time to counsel your patients about weight loss, about diet, um, you know, is quite important. Okay. Um, so this is something. So before we continue, I can see quite a number of people are here. We're almost a hundred now uh, from different parts of the country. This is from cardio care, more special to people Abuja. We are teaching on resistant hypertension. We have gone through what it, what is defined as. We have gone through the kind of drug that will be used before we can say it is hypertension. We have gone through certain characteristics that make people like. We have differentiated between those that are just not properly treated, then those that are pseudo resistant hypertension and those that are true resistant hypertension. And we have also said that it's very important because people resist hypertension, even if after you have controlled them, they have a high risk. Of developing kidney failure, stroke, stroke no. MI, and even having other forms of cardiovascular deaths. So it's quite important. And so we have gone through all of this. Um, cardio care is a member of the living hospital group. Okay, so back to our case. And for those that use the case, we are going to do another poll now. 65 year old, blood pressure is constantly elevated. He was diagnosed 20 years ago. He has underlying abnormal renal function. He's currently on the Fedipine, Labeta Law, and Rosatan. Everything else was fine. I said that the blood pressure was above normal. Okay, so this patient now came to you. Uh, what will you do? So I want us to go to the polls. I want us to go to the polls and then um, and click. This is not an INEC poll, so, so just the, click. the question. The case to continue to the next page. So the patient was given. So yes, so the patient was given in that upper mind added to the treatment. But eight weeks later, he became dizzy. BP was low at home, and he started reducing medications on his own. So the blood pressure became 120 over 60, 68. So what do you do? Do you do 24 hour blood pressure? Do you stop the diuretic so I can go back up? Do you continue medications and see in eight weeks? Do you give hematinics and allow to go home? What do you do? The patient, you've controlled the blood pressure now after he came in. You, get, you added a dopamine or a diuretic, and later now he's coming back with um, dizziness. He had to do some of the drugs, and the blood pressure is how do you proceed? So let us use let us use the poll. Let's do the poll. Click, click, click. Don't worry, this is anonymous. It's open ballots, was anonymous. It's not APC or PDP. Just pick one. Mm -hmm. So in the question, we have already answered the first poll. Yes. I had the a diuretic. a diuretic, a long, a tarzide like diuretic. So, but that, diuretic, that means there was calcium channel blocker. blocker. There was a, an a, a and, and, and now a diuretic. And of course, patient was still on the So, now what, 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 what will we do now? Do we stop this diuretic? Since the patient is feeling dizzy, do we continue as it is? Now we have good control. Um, or what do we do? Or do we add hematinic? Maybe his blood is low, that's why he's feeling dizzy. Okay. Answer, answer, answer. We want you to answer. Try it. Don't be a, afraid. Try it. The worst thing that you can do is to get it wrong. <laughs> okay, so about 56% of people have answered. Um, so uh, perhaps we can end the poll now. Great. So we'll share the results. 72% say we should do 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor. Um, 17% say we should stop the diuretic. Uh, 
And another group said, continue medications. Let him come back and again in two months' time. Nobody says she did a maternity, thank God. <laughs> and go, allowed to go home. Maybe some people wanted to increase the drug. How many people wanted to increase the drug? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should have added that to the also. <laughs> okay, so yes, indeed, um, this was an actual patient. So what we did was he do a 24 hour block. So most of us are quite. Can you walk us through um, what that happened? So the, the, the guest had a 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring dog. And this, this is the result we got. The daytime average was fine. All the averages were within normal. The only thing noted was that the blood pressure at night was higher than the daytime blood pressure. And that's what we call a reverse DP, yeah. which also has its own cardiovascular risk, risk uh, uh, prognosis. So looking at the base value, the blood pressure is controlled at home. And the reason why this you need to do this is the patient came to the hospital, mm. the blood pressure is good, but company of dizziness at home. Yeah. You must be sure that at home, the patient is not having episode of hypertension because you expect the blood pressure at home for the patient to be relatively lower than what you have in, your in the hospital because of the white coat aggravation that is seen during the, the clinic, but we are able to rule this out. So our decision at that point was to just reduce the amount of labetalol so that why in you case- Why did you Why did you remove the diuretic? Some people say you should move the Yes, the reason why the diuretic has to be there is if you look at our definition and introduction. Exactly. Drugs with complementary mechanism of action. Yeah. So if you remove the diuretic, you have returned the patient back yeah. to where you're coming from. So it's just a matter of time. You go back to the go first back. hole. Yeah. So the most reasonable thing to do is reduce the labetal so that you are sure that no matter what happened, this patient cannot have episode of hypertension at home and you continue your patient follow up with appropriate education. So if you have a question, please put it in the Q and A um, box. Uh, I think we're also broadcasting on, on Facebook as well, on our Facebook page, cardiocare.center. If you have a question, there's a Q and A box, just write it there. Um, it doesn't matter any question from this or from anything at all, and then we'll just answer it shortly. So just put that there. And if you want to share the question, just you raise your hand when the time comes. Um, and that is what should happen. So, pseudo resistance, pseudo resistance hypertension. Can you share more light about the pseudo resistance hypertension? Like, like we said initially, studies, different studies have shown yeah. that one third of patients that we classify as resistant hypertension are pseudo resistant. I mean, truly, they're not, they're not resistant hypertension. they don't have resistant hypertension, but there are some factors which we'll quickly look at. There are about five to six factors. Number one is, have you measured the blood pressure appropriately? So for BP measurement technique, we give you a firstly elevated blood pressure. Yeah. And you can say ah, this blood pressure. And the commonest mistakes, the three, one, using inappropriately sized cuff, yeah. measuring BP over Clots. patient clots, yes. then not allowing the patient to have appropriate time of rest. Maybe because of the busy schedule of the clinic, as the patient <laughs> is walking into the hospital, almost immediately sit down there, you're measuring the blood pressure over his suit, over his babariga, over then the cough. I've seen the places where people use their hand to hold the cough because the cough wouldn't go around. <laughs> so, all those factors will give you inappropriately eye reading. And that is why we put the picture that ideally your patient is coming, your patient should rest for at least five minutes, should be well seated. Yeah. The temperature of the room is conducive, not too hot, not too cold. The patient is not having full bladder. Yes, they are not that trying is to, very, very important. They are not trying to go to the bathroom. Yes, they are not going to the bedroom. Okay, so that can, then you try as much as possible, do it over the patient's bare skin, and yeah. the patient, both feet well, well planted on the, on on the, the floor, floor, not crossing the leg, the back rested, 
you are not talking, the patient is not talking. The time for many BP is not the time to be discussing politics or sports. And the patient, and the patient is not on their phone. So yes. They are taking their blood pressure and they are on their phone. So sure. make sure that is also not done. So this is a this is a common mistake. Very it's, made, common. it's made by nurses, it's made by doctors, doctors consultants, everything. everybody. Sometimes we are uh, very conscious of the patient's dignity. I will say hey, this woman wore a very long dress, so let's just do it over the cloth. Now it's important to note that uh, when you do blood pressure over the cloth, it can change by as much as 50 millimeters of mercury. Yeah. So you could have it much higher than it actually is, or much lower than it actually is. So it can give you a false reading. So doing blood pressure over cloth is strongly discouraged. And sometimes you, you tell the patient to roll up, so it's like forming two tonnicky. You have a tight <laughs> whatever, then you put your so if, if, even if they roll up, it should, it should not be tight where they are roll, where just roll. If you can roll up and there's no prayer effect on the arm, okay. But ideally, it should be on the bare skin. And all these things they look very trivial, but they affect your they vision do. significantly. They do. So we have had cases where people have been referred to us and they say blood pressure is normal or something, and you take time to do the blood pressure properly and you make it. Totally different diabetes. Yes. Totally. Somebody will say heart failure, you have never been hypertensive. You just take all the precautions and you will be able to measure the blood pressure. So make sure that you have the appropriate cough. Yes. So um, in our clinic, we have multiple coughs. Um, sorry to pull us back. I'm looking for blood pressure monitor. Please make sure that you, you should have it. And if you cannot, you can refer to cardiac care. We'll do it and we'll result back to the patient for them to do. Make sure you have the pump. Make sure the patient is sitting down. There should have been no activity or straight up activity uh, exercise in the past 30 oh. minutes to one hour. No cigar in the past one hour. You need to ask. If you don't ask, you, I mean, you cannot know. Yes. Especially I've had cigarettes in the past one hour. Coffee also in the past one hour could affect the blood pressure you are measuring. So you might have an inappropriately high blood pressure and you start acting. Meanwhile, it was something they yes. did. Or they just fought in the car park of your hospital <laughs> and came to your consulting room. <laughs> or they fought another patient that they are supposed to be now after fighting and enter the you now just check their blood pressure. And, and how much they are blocked. Just to the so that is a poor technique. So, so if you look at this picture, means, very nice. Yes. He's seated, his hand is rested, and he's at a good height. His hand is not too high, and he's not holding his own hand like this, just holding his hand by himself. That will change it. The cough is against best skin. His, his feet are not crossed. His back is rested. He should not be talking. Nobody should be talking to him. He should not be answering phone or checking his at the same time. Okay, so all of that should be checked yeah. and that will help us to get the proper Very thing. important. So this is number one reason why people have falsely elevated blood pressure. So the second one is white coat hypertension. Or let me put it right, white coat aggravation <laughs> of the blood pressure. <laughs> because from this study, about almost 9,000 patients with so-called resistant hypertension yeah. based on office reading. Yeah. Was, were used for this patient. And at the end of the day, close to 40% of them, it was just only due to white coats aggravation of the BP. And this is where the use of ABPM is comes in. It comes in at the point of diagnosis. Correct. Along treatment to rule out things like this. Yeah. We also mentioned quickly mask hypertension after this one. So what happened is patient comes to the hospital, mm -hmm. maybe due to phobia, anxiety, what would the doctor say? The blood pressure goes up high. And this group of patients are the patients that will come to the clinic with the complaint we have in the last poll. These are patients that at home will be complaining to you of dizziness, yeah. weakness, and they will come to the hospital. You check their blood pressure, their blood pressure is very high. Yeah. And another thing that will give it away is you see patients in the hospital with persistently elevated blood pressure and with little or no end organ damage. Yes. So what you need to do is do 24 hours ambulatory blood pressure monitoring for this patient. And this patient will go home and come back with good BP control. And you just know that, oh, this is just a white coat effect. And at that point, what you use as your measure of assessing your drug uh, effectiveness or adjustment is that ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. The ambulatory blood pressure, blood pressure is, more, is closer to normal. So the patient yes. is doing the activities, whether they're angry, everything that takes an average. 
So typically, a, a typical weekly blood pressure that we do uh, may have up to 70, 80 different readings yes. of blood pressure in a day. So you will have a truer reading and it more correlates with cardiovascular risk. Now, there are some studies that have shown that even this white coat hypertension is still associated with cardiovascular risk. Yes. So it's not yes. something that we it's should not, also... It's not benign. It's not benign. We should not just say it's just white coat. Okay. You may still need to start um, lifestyle changes, but it's important. And you can see that one thing we're hammering on now is doing an ambulatory blood pressure is for these patients. Uh, so you may need to have them come in maybe to cardio care and then we can do it for them and then get the result and then you'll not make the adjustments uh, when necessary. Then we also talk about masked hypertension. It's the yeah. opposite of white coat. Yes. The patient comes to the hospital, the blood pressure is it's high. Normal. But at home. At home, the blood pressure is high. And what we give that away is you see someone with apparently normal blood pressure but with significant head organ damage, damage let me like hypertrophy, um, CKD, and, and all the rest. And we see them a lot. They are coming with you that, you know, this only hypertension could have caused this problem. Mm -hmm. And they say their blood pressure is always normal. Any time they go to the hospital, it's normal. What they have is mass hypertension or village people. <laughs> <laughs> when you go to the place where they are supposed to check your blood pressure, it came back normal. <laughs> and then when you went home, it went back up. So uh, that's just a joke. I'm, I'm just a joke. <laughs> All right, so if you put your questions in the Q&A, I will continue. Okay, so um, when do you suspect white coat hypertension? So you've already said that when patients have target organ, don't have target organ damage, um, and they have blood pressure coming up, and then there's also when patients um, don't have uncontrolled blood pressure in the hospital, in the hospital, but at home they are feeling dizzy, yes. those are things you should worry about. And then you do your ambulatory blood pressure monitor. Of course, there are normal values that you use. Um, so what about adherence? Adherence is another big issue because if patient is not taking medication, there's yeah. no way the blood pressure will be controlled. Or their medication finished. Yes. Or, or their money or, or their money finished. Or there's no money to, <laughs> to restock after finishing the first one. And study have shown that the best adherence is within the first the early period of uh uh, block player yeah. medication use. So it's one year. After one year, people's the adherence start Drops. dropping. And from this study, at the end of 10 years, only 40% <laughs> of patients <laughs> who are using the drug regularly. This is even in the advanced country where you have all the NHS, all the insurance, whatever. Only 40% of them were faithful with their with medications. Their and from that study, what was found was the older the patient is, the higher the chance of using the drug regularly. So young patients are difficult to deal with everywhere. So you have to do your education because somebody will tell you, I'm just uh, 40 years old, I'm too young to be on medication. That's just you. I'm too young to be on medication. And, this somebody and, and that is wrong, by the way. Very, very wrong. Very, very wrong. There's something that before we continue, there's something I want to also address. When the doctor instituted poor adherence, you hear a patient say that the doctor say your blood pressure is now normal. Stop the drug once oh, you get that, normal. That blood pressure is, is normal for your age. Exactly. So if somebody comes and says, I took the drug for one month. When the blood pressure came back to 12080, doctor said I should stop. No, no. That blood pressure is what, that drug is what brought it to normal. So if you stop it, you're going to go back up again. So that is something that we should. And of course, adherence was also better when they were seeing a cardiologist or when they were using a combination therapy. 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 So if you're taking three single tablets, it's more difficult. Than uh, just taking one tablet. I'm not sure this is Nigeria because I Nigeria, know if, if, we, if we repeat, replicate this study here, I know female we have I think so. better compliance. But in that study there, they found out that male have they, they perform compliance. better with compliance compared. But I know in Nigeria, females are females are better. Okay, so uh, is the patient um, compliant to therapy? The other things, cost of medication. Sometimes you don't give them clear instructions. Yes. Education. And if there's anything you take away from this, is that education, education, education. You want to take time and explain to the patient what's happening. It is not a one of. It's not malaria. You want them to be part of it. Yes. Sometimes patients have side effects. A patient comes to you with erectile dysfunction. Don't write it off and say your life not better. No. <laughs> Quality of life is also important. It's also as important as quality of life. You want to make certain changes, okay? And then psychological factor, patients are in denial, inconvenient dosing. You tell them they take it six hours, take it at 2 a.m. Okay, so you want patients to have clear instructions and that helps with it. So what about this other reason? This other reason for pseudo-hypertension? 
is the regiment adequate? Inadequate regiment. And the number one I would discuss there is the last point on yeah. that slide. Physician. Physician inertia. We see this patient uh, is on this drug. The next appointment, 15080, continue medications. Two months after, 15080, continue medication. Six months after, con because I used to ask people, what do we think we change? Nothing. Because it's, 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 <laughs> it's fear mm. or understanding. And sometimes the patient tells you, doctor, is that I did not sleep last night. Doctor, is that I traveled. Doctor, is that, and you know what I normally tell patients is that all these things are part of life. Yeah. In spite of it, once you are seated and do the blood pressure correctly, and you have at a resting position, we should get a good enough blood pressure control. And so the physician should be, we arm with this knowledge you are giving, make sure that you are using the correct drugs. Make sure that you use the proper doses of drugs yes. and optimize the drugs as needed yes. to the correct dose. Correct combinations. Because we now look at everything apart from the fear of adverse effects, we will find out that all other points have something to do with the doctor one way or the other. Yeah. Are we using the correct combination? Yeah. I've seen people, patients with unnifedipine and amlodipine. Ah. It's two drugs in the same class. You are not going to get anything from that. I am going to cause more side effects. Yes. The diuretic you are using, which we talked about long acting diuretic, either a tyrosine diuretic or a tyrosine like, likely. So, in this group, we're not talking of flusamide, not tosamide, except in some, in some condition where those groups of diuretics are preferred over the tazide or non tazide like. So, we need to take that into cognizance. The one that I want, I want to talk about is drug induced. Yes. People are taking some other drugs that is causing the blood pressure not to be controlled. And so, it's not a real use hypertension. Something is that blood pressure. Yes. NSA, NSA, steroids. Cough syrup. Some cough syrup yes. also. Some people take uh, cough syrup to sleep. And that also will shift their blood pressure. All these cold uh, medications that we use. Contraceptives. Contraceptives. Some people abuse drugs, cocaine, and all this. So until you identify that, keep increasing your drug. The patient yeah. keeps coming because what is foiling? That's poor control. You have not dealt with it. Now I want to highlight one, and I saw this case in Ibadan when I was in Ibadan. Um, corticosteroids, topical corticosteroids. So they call one of the patient. The patient says, "Show me." I did an echo with the patient, and I said, "What kind of cream did you use?" And I could see that the patient was thoroughly bleached. And so straight away I said, "Look, this this cream was stop." And without adjusting medication, the blood pressure got got better control. So sometimes even topical corticosteroids. And long term of steroids for asthma control or other yes. things also could play a very big role. And some people are taking steroids while they are waiting, while they are doing you exercise. Mean, yes. And so that could also be something um, that could happen. So okay. our history is very important. Very. Don't just look at the BP and just yeah. start changing your drugs. You have to ask. What, what, what about lifestyle? Are there lifestyle things that could also create this fake idea of hey, not, We talked about salts yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. It looks very trivial, but increased intake of salt has been found to affect blood pressure control. Apart from in, in, uh, increasing food retention, it also brought the effect of almost all oh, class of, uh, of medication you are using. Yeah. So reducing salt intake is very, very, very important. Obesity yeah, also. Excess alcohol. Excess alcohol. The person is still drinking heavily. And it's coming to you, and you are just adjusting and adjusting and adjusting. Okay, and you are now saying that is, that is not a true. It's not, it's not a true. true that, that. So you have to address that. And one another important one is this obstructive sleep affair. Yeah, which maybe because of our challenge history, I don't diagnose it well. But once you have this a history of a patient, excessive daytime sobriness, ex snoring. Yeah, you should. You should have that in mind as a possible. There are also things, secondary hypertension that will be there. You should also look out for it. Yes. Patient will have kidney disease, patient will have aldosteronism, thyroid, you know, disease. thyroid, all those. So you need to keep a very um, wide view. So, how do we now evaluate this hypertension, sir? So, you're looking at this patient, the blood pressure is not controlled. Yeah. So, the first thing, exclude this from the single extent. And what do you need to do? Measure the blood pressure accurately, okay. taking into consideration all those things we talked about. But then explore whether the patient 
is this actually taking the drug? Okay. All the questions we ask, cost. In some area where they have the facility, they do uh, drug analysis in yeah, the blood or yeah, in the urine, yeah. but we don't do that for now. Then make sure that the regimen is adequate. Yeah. Combination is good. The dosage is correct. Then look out for other drugs that will affect your BP control. Then those life, lifestyle factors we talked about, you look at them and institute appropriate uh, treatment. If the patient needs to see a dietitian, send to exactly. the dietitian. And, and I think we are under utilizing nutritionist and dietitian yes. in concurrent day practice. And the role is quite important. Very, very yeah. important. The okay. diet, the weight, yeah. the obesity is smoking. Good. Yes. All of that. Then look out for secondary causes. Check for thyroid function tests. Uh, you Check need the to renal action. Yes. To listen during your examination whether there's renal uh, renal bill. And, and, and how do you listen for renal bury? From the umbilicus. Go two centimeters lateral and superior. Use the bed of your stethoscope and listen there for a buoy. And, and I've actually heard it. Patient was managed everywhere and we picked it up. And then thereafter, we now um, take that and then and then do a, a Doppler to yes. confirm it. Luckily, in cardio care also, we can actually fix renal artery stenosis um, inter minimally invasive without surgery. So the patient doesn't have to go to open surgery. In 30, one hour is done, the patient can go in six to eight hours. Okay. So when you have done number one to five, and you have ruled all those ones out, and this patient is still like this, then this that is the time to refer the patient to a specialist. Yeah. You've done all that, you've checked well, and I you have sure the patient is still on the, on the proper view. Yes, then get specialist to check the patient, yeah. send the patient to a specialist to take the next level of action. Yeah. Yeah. So th that's what we have talked about. Yes. Uh, we've talked about when to refer to a specialist. We talk about also adjusting the drugs. Yes. So you may make sure that the patient is on all the classes of drugs. And um, you know, sometimes you could refer to a specialist. Cardio care is here, but several other um, good hospitals are around, um, including government hospitals. Um, but you could send to cardio care. You could get, make sure that the blood pressure is well controlled, exclude other things. Now, it's very important that while you are treating the hypertension, remember that hypertension in itself is not what we are treating. We are treating the risk for cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. So more often than not, you need to remember to take care of all the other cardiovascular yes. risks, cholesterol, blood, blood sugar, sugar, you know, all of that. Make sure that all of that is taken care of. There is no point patient taking drugs to bring out the blood pressure and still has a myocardial infarction because you do not check other things. So that's quite right. Also, important. the examination for all those end organs should also be part of the routine care. Look at the high, looking for retinopathy, yeah. Your kidney function test should be done, your ECG, your EPO, your carotid doppler. Yeah. All those must be done and must be well documented. And that is part of the reason why you may need to send to the specialist to do that. Then we'll not talk of the medication use. Exactly. And from the pathway to study. Wow, yes, that's yes, a very good study. And that look at this resistant hypertension and the, the study, what the study came out with is that primary hyperaldosteronism. And that is why the use of mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist spirulatum now comes into So in fact, to play. We, we are not really waiting for, for patients to have heart failure for yes. spirulatum. So spirulatum, a lot of times, can be very effective in patients that have mineralocorticoid-related, uh, you know, um, anti, I mean, hypertension, yes. receptor hypertension. Typically, we start from that around 50 milligrams yes. daily to be able to control, so the and it, it could do it could do wonders. Yes, in that study, it was compared against bisoprolol and dose as the same. Yeah, and uh, spironolactone was found to be superior to those other two medications in bringing down the blood pressure. That means you have adjusted the other three well exactly so the next thing now is add, add spinal spinal to of course to you need to also check for it you know you need to check for all the other electrolyte devices. yes i want to add, i ask spinal you need to begin the end if you do it before you need to continue and check because remember you are using spinal lactone and you like to give an arb yes both of those drugs will raise the yes. yes. so it's quite important to check that as well so it was compared against that Pathway two is the name of a, of his study. It's not, it's not the second pathway. So <laughs> it's the name of his, his study. So uh, in conclusion, sir. So what, what are the things 
when a physician is considering the diagnosis of a mystery hypertension, they should ask themselves the following 10 questions. Yes. So don't, don't uh, I mean, I know people are snapping the slides. Don't worry, snap the slides, but we will also send you the slides. If you register properly, your email is there. We will send you the slides so that you can use. Uh, if you are using the slides or sharing them, share them and give appropriate credits. We don't mind. So far, patients are getting better. So uh, can you tell us these 10 questions that a physician can ask themselves? So the number one is, is this a true resistant hypertension or a pseudo resistant hypertension? So that means, is the blood pressure really elevated? So that will lead you to the second question to answer whether it's a white coat problem. So then you now, you now ask yourself, will an ambulatory monitoring help helpful in these patients? Then we also said, and if you don't have ambulatory monitoring, the next best thing is to do home monitoring. Home we tell the patient the instruction. Exactly. You must take time and explain to them how they will measure. They measure morning and evening. They typically measure sitting down properly, all the precautions they take. They take three readings, discard the first reading, and take the arrow of the last two, and then keep that record. So that can also help. help it's still it. not as good as ambulatory, but at least in the absence of it, or if the patient cannot be referred, that's what they should have. Okay, so, so the third one is what is the extent of target organ damage? Because so that is what we start looking for. Yes, those with white coat hypertension, they have very high blood pressure, but no target organ yeah. damage. Those with mask, they have seemingly normal blood pressure. So that must be taken into account. Then the number four is have I given appropriate regimen? We talked about combining drugs in the same class, use of short acting diuretics. Use of drugs at not at some optimal doses. doses. Or drugs that are not complementing yeah. each other. Okay, number five. Now, have I added a diuretic? <laughs> have I added a correct diuretic? Yes. And uh, there are several diuretics that you can add. Um, occasionally, lasix cream is added, especially in patients yes. with kidney failure. Uh, lasix could quite be helpful in that regard. In patients with kidney failure, we know that thiazides don't work as well because mm -hmm. of the way. And the tubules are at that stage of their disease. So um, sometimes fusamide could be helpful in that regard. But typically, for patients, talk about indapamide, hydrochlorothiazide, clofalido, you know, all these drugs quite be helpful. Okay, number six is so, patient are getting very demand. Is that patient? I will tell a story. When I first started medical residency, I've done this many times and I've done it. I went and saw a patient, the pressure was very high. I gave patient drug. Get the patient drug, kept on increasing the drug, adding drugs, adding the drugs. I forgot to ask whether the patient was taking the drug. <laughs> One day I just shouted at the patient, why is your blood pressure not this? You did not buy this drug. And the patient went and pulled out all the prescriptions of all the drugs and bought all of them at the same time. Oh my God, did I pray <laughs> for that patient? So it's quite important to also check. The patient may not have been taking your yes. drug and that is the reason why the blood pressure is not that up. So you need to ask. Then how can I help these patients to be more compliant? Be more compliant. So that's why you need to educate the patient. Education. Get the patient involved in your decision. Education. There's no point writing drugs the patient will not buy. Yeah. So the patient, ah, there's a, there was a patient that came last week with atrium. But right from the, the patient made it clear, I don't have money. Money. So I will be. It will be. It will be stupid on my own side to now write <laughs> hyperpalliative medication that I know the patient. They will just get so you. just get your flu simide you know, and the patient. Then, what have you done about lifetime modification? Yeah, I know some people, some of us have been seeing patients and we have never talked about weight loss. Yeah, we have never talked about diets or stopping. We smoking. have never talked about smoking because we don't think the effects treatment significantly, but studies have shown that all these things are very, losing 10 kg brings down your systolic blood pressure between six to 10 milliliters of mercury. If I don't medication. To take any medication. Um, um, salt alone, eight over eight, three. Exercise, almost 10 over five. Yeah. So all yeah, of this, yeah, have yeah, we have a guest that was, he was on three medications before. And we've been talking about weight loss. This one started active, with, with By the time I saw him, like three months, he had lost close to 10 kg. <laughs> he started having hypertension. Yeah, you have to, you have to die just in the medication. He's down just on perin dupil, maybe just five, <laughs> five milligrams of instead of in, it's it's on perin dupil in that amount. I'm not doing it. So, so it's he, quite important. He, then we talked about this 
Sodom it is it, it it affects whether we like it or not, or not it is there. Then let's screen for secondary hypertension. We, we treated patients for blood pressure for a long time on someone said, let's just check for the thyroid function. Yeah. And lo and build hyperthyroidism and with so, treatment. So, so, they so are very important. sometimes you are bid not to to save the patient's money, you are actually costing the patient more money. Yes. Because you don't want to do all the tests. You say, okay, the patient doesn't have money. Then you find yourself giving more and more drugs. Taking drugs that they don't need for one year mm. is more expensive than doing the test on the day one. Yes, and give what to the patient. The patient. Or taking drugs without adjusting and taking kind of double damage and treating it will cost more, more harm than good. So these are some things that we should consider. Um, so these are some references. And um, yes, it's from cardio care. We'll take questions. I can see a lot of questions. And some of the questions, even if you have a patient that's difficult to manage, you can um, write that in the Q&A. Please don't mention the patient's name. Um, um, and then we'll just talk about the modalities generally. And then we'll start taking questions. But while we are preparing for the questions, um, Olua Sommi from, um, from Sevier, um, 10 minutes presentation briefly on, on, the, on medications. So just listen to this and then we'll answer the questions. I can answer the question, what drug is the best for diastolic hypertension? And what does persistent diastolic hypertension signify? And that question is, why is female sex associated with <laughs> hypertension? So we'll answer some of these um, questions and more. If you have more questions, um, please add them. And if you have comments too, we'll be glad to take them um, 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 shortly. So um, Olua Somi uh, from Serbia, please um, omit yourself, you can share your slides and then we'll you have 10 minutes so that we can take all your questions together. All right, good Put your questions sir. down and then we'll go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. But I am not being able to share my screen. I'm not enabled. Can you quickly please enable me? You are enabled. Yes, you are enabled. You can go ahead. I have on my screen host this able yeah, participant try sharing screen. Try it. Try it. If you have a question, put them in the box. As well as okay. you can you also put your questions in the box. We'll, we'll come back and answer all the questions together. All right. Can you see my screen now, sirs? Yes. Yeah, very well. We can see your screen. Yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. Good afternoon. My name is Uluwa Somi. I'm from Sevier Pharmaceuticals. So quickly, in 10 minutes or less, I'll be speaking about the right combination for your resistant hypertensive patient. So doctors in the house, uh, physicians in the house, for those of your patients that Dr. Iseko and uh, Dr. Alamileko had talked about. That, uh, Hello. Okay. About your patient, I will quickly just share, talk about this medication. So, Sevier has a combination of perindopril, indapamide, and amlodipine, a solution anytime you need a three medication. It's a combination of perindopril, indapamide, and amlodipine, and it's the only single triple kill therapy with a guideline preferred diuretic. So just like Dr. Laleko mentioned, the guideline says we should make sure that we're giving an optimal choice of antihypertensive in the management of the patient. We should make sure that we have increased the dose so that we can achieve effective blood pressure control. And finally, we should make sure that it is a tazide-like diuretic rather than a tazide diuretic because it effectively reduces the blood pressure of this year patients. This is according to the ISH 2020, just a few years back. Now, the latest British guideline also mentioned step four, your resistant hypertensive patient, an ACE inhibitor, a calcium channel blocker, and a diuretic. And he emphasizes such as in dapamide, in preference to hydrochlorothiazide. So as we go further, we'll know the reason why our patient needs to be on this class of medications, the benefits that our patients will get on these medications. All right, 
the basic reasons why the guideline actually make reference to ACIs is because of its improvements on the endothelial function. So it's been seen in several guidelines or several journals that with uh, ACIs, you have a brandykinin blockage, which, is a, which has a potential to the fibrinolytic balance, enhances ischemic preconditioning, and improves endothelial function. Whereas for the ARVs, they cause a compensatory increase in the AG2 levels, either the receptor two, three, and four, that can actually cause instability and rupture of the plates, which would actually put our patients into myocardial infraction. This is a journal, or these are three different journals as of 2019, emphasizing a three pluses for ACIs in the management of your hypertensive patients. So we're giving those three pluses to perindopril, and we will know why very soon. Another meta-analysis of about 46 trials in over 248 patients shows that ACIs has less risk for myocardial infraction in your patients. Now, these are trials showing different agents, the ACE inhibitors, the CCBs, the beta blocker, the ARVs, and the diuretic. We can see the incidence line and we can see how the ACE inhibitors had shown more effects in reducing myocardial infraction in 46 trials, as long as a tazard like diuretic, showing a myocardial infraction reduction of about 28% with the ACIs. Another study, again, in the same 2019, the 2020 rather, comparing ACIs and ARBs in reduction of MI and dyslipidemia after a stent implantation in about 3,000 patients. ACI shows a reduction of about 1.5%, where ARBs are just still showing a 2.6 reduction. So these are the reasons why the guideline is making reference to ACIs in the management of these hypertensive patients. Now, why in dapamide? Why is the guideline saying in dapamide? Why is it saying it has to be a tazard like diuretic? Number one, they are highly lipophilic and binding to the vessel walls, reducing the cellular calcium concentration. Two, they have an antioxidant effect, reducing the oxidative stress. There's an indirect uh, diuretic effect, correcting the sodium overload in the arterial wall. And finally, the renal elimination of this indapamide solution is about 5%. So there is a cardiovascular benefit and also improving the endothelial function of your patient. Those are the reasons why the guidelines are saying it has to be a tazard type or tazard like diuretic in your patients. Now, which of the ACIs are we going to be using for this patient? Particularly, like we have discussed today, your resistant hypertensive patient. There is a journal as at uh, 2000, talking about the fact that not all ACIs are equal, putting a focus on both ramipril and perindopril. Amongst all ACIs, the agent perindopril in particular has a pleotropic effect that is not equal to all ACIs. It's brandykinin site selectivity and subsequent enhancement of the nitric oxide and the inhibition of the endothelial cell apoptosis. So this is the benefit your patients will get when they are on a perindopril-based solution. And apart from that, a large amount of evidence has been shown with perindopril. We'll see more as we go further. So from this clinical journal of postgraduate of medicine, it's saying perindopril should be amongst the preferred treatment when you want to choose an ACI or a RAS inhibitor in management of your hypertensive patients or your resistant hypertensive patients. Now this introduces us into uh, other RAS inhibitors or other medications we use in managing our patients with endothelial dysfunction, including telmisotan, amlodipine, a beta blocker, and perindopril. It's shown even at five milligram of perindopril, you are effectively correcting the endothelial dysfunction. Just like Dr. Lale mentioned, a patient who was already on a triple combination, but because the patient was using the medication, 
effectively was able to reduce the patient to just five milligrams. And I'm sure there is an effective cardiovascular protection in that patient. As you can see in the study that was done as far back as 2003, cover seal effectively at five milligrams corrects the endothelial dysfunction comparing to other combinations or other medications available for our patients, including the telmisatan, even at 160 milligrams. Now, only ACIs decrease myocardial infraction significantly. So we're seeing the fact that even amongst the ARBs, amongst other ACIs, we're able to show that your patients are being prone to have um, MI in the long run because the angiotensin II uh, receptor is being overflogged and there is a rupture and apoptosis, and then your patient could eventually have an MI. But with the HOPE study in Bamipril and also the Europa study with Cobacil, you had a better reduction with, uh, in myocardial infraction with Cobacil. Now, for what reasons are all these benefits to our patients? Apart from the cardiovascular benefits, the endothelial dysfunction, the reduction in MI, perindopril has a longer stroke to peak ratio compared to other ACE inhibitors and even other RAS inhibitors. You can see the fact that with perindopril, your patients are effectively controlled. In the next slide, you see the fact that our patients most times, according to studies, at risk of myocardial infraction and stroke at the early morning hours of the day. So if this medication you are giving to your patient does not have a 24 hours coverage, you are not optimally, like Dr. Iseko mentioned, optimal treatment for your patients. Effectively covering the patient against the hour where there is a stroke or a myocardial infraction. So if the combination you are using for this patient is still with hydrochlorothiazide, there is a problem. An effective control is not there. The patient is not effectively controlled for a full 24 hours. So like I mentioned earlier, I'm presenting Coveran Plus, a combination of Covacil, who has a trough to peak ratio of over 100, and low dipping 100, in dapamide 100. So with this triple medication in one tablet daily, you are sure that your patient is effectively covered for over 24 hours. Because in the early morning hours when we have the psychiatric reading, your patient is still well covered. So we have the pain, pain, uh, the pain study where these patients who were uncontrolled on ARB and lodipine combination were switched to cover and plus. And then they were effectively having a further blood pressure reduction of about 28 millimeter mercury in their systolic and a 14.5 in their diastolic. So those your patients who are uncontrolled and we're afraid this patient might end up getting to become a resistant, have a resistant hypertension. So if we actually switch this patient to cover and plus, you effectively reduce their blood pressure effectively and bring them to target. No matter the stage of the hypertension, is it a stage grade one hypertensive patient? your grade two hypertensive patients or your grade three hypertensive patients who were afraid this patient is not controlled. When you switch them to cover and plus, you achieve a better further blood pressure reduction in those patients. Now, apart from the blood pressure reduction, we have established the endothelial dysfunction correction. We have, we have established myocardial infraction. We have established the blood pressure reduction. In the advanced CCB study, it showed as of 2013, it showed that with Coveran Plus, your patients will have a total mortality reduction of about 28%. So we're actually reducing mortality in this patient with Coveran Plus. Now, like I mentioned earlier, we had, we've had a wealth of studies. In the ASCOT study, they were all hypertensive patients of about 19,000. The advanced, it was Coveran with indapamide in hypertensive diabetic patients. IVET were patient, elderly patients were over 80, of 80 years, and they were, their blood pressure were effectively reduced with, with or without endopamide, covacil with or without endopamide. Europa is on your patients with coronary artery disease. 
And then your progress study is for your patients with stroke, secondary stroke reduction by 39%. The primary is the acute myocardial infarction patient. And the PEP CHF are your chronic heart failure patients. So colossal based solution has been tested, let's use that word, and proven with uh, cardiovascular protection and mortality reduction, ensuring that your patients are effectively protected from mortality. So this study actually shows, like I mentioned, with perindopril in the Europa study of about 6,000, ASCOTs alone in this study were about 19,000 patients, a reduction of 24 percent of CV mortality and the advanced CCB study of 32% reduction in CV mortality. So on a final note, the medication of Coveron Plus has been proven to be complementary. Like Dr. Olaleko mentioned, the combination must be very right. They must be complementary. Perindopril and amlodipine and indapamide are complementary in their mode of action ensuring that your patients are effectively controlled, achieving unique cardiovascular protection, superior MI reduction and tolerability, which is very important in our patients. So it comes, the Coveron Plus comes in four different doses. 5.1.255, it starts with the Coversil, five milligram, and then your indapamide in the combination of the Coveron Plus is 1.25 where you have your cover seal to be five milligrams, either strength of amlodipine. Then when you have the 10 milligram cover seal, you have indapamide to be 2.5 and either strength of amlodipine. So you have four different strengths to tailor to your patient's need, whatever the target you want to achieve. So with cover and plus, like I mentioned, you have four different um, medications. Now for your patients who are your stage two hypertensive patients, we have Coveram. I'm sure so many people are familiar with Coveram. Coveram is a combination of perindopril and indapamide. So as we have Coversil in five and 10 milligram, you have amlodipine in five and 10 milligram. For those your patients who you want to give adherence, just one tablet daily, two medications. Your patients who need two medications maybe uncontrolled on a CCB, your stage one or two hypertensive patients, or patients uncontrolled on immunotherapy or BRAS. With Coveram, you achieve an effective blood pressure reduction. And then for your newly diagnosed hypertensive patients, you wanna start with a five milligram or you wanna titrate to 10 milligram. So Coversil comes in five and 10 milligram. So like I mentioned, for your patients who need a three medication, your resistant hypertensive patients. A single pill of Coveram Plus, it's the right medication or the right regimen for your patients. Thank you very much. All those medications are one tablet every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Seko. Thank you, Dr. Lamleko. Come on, put on this, this uh, camera. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for your presentation. Can you stop sharing your screen, please? Um, so I will take questions now. We'll take the questions now. Um, so there are quite a number of questions here. So you say what drugs are best for diastolic hypertension? What drugs are best for diastolic hypertension? Um, you want to? Um, okay. Can you stop sharing your screen, please? Okay, what drugs are best for diastolic hypertension? What does persistent diastolic hypertension signify? Once your blood pressure is not up to target, either the be diastolic or systolic, the blood pressure is not controlled. Not until the two, once one is not uh, up to target, there is poor control. And the question, the best drug for diastolic hypertension. I would say there is no class okay. of drug of the antihypertensive we have, starting from the beta blocker, the angiotensin receptor blocker, 
and it is a convert to the SME inhibitor, the diuretic, the calcium channel blocker that cannot be used. Though calcium channel blocker has been said to be good for isolated systolic hypertension. Yeah. But all classes of medication that we have works for both systolic and, and diastolic. diastolic. I want to also correct a, a, a myth. So before people used to say that it's only diastolic, that matters. That if your blood pressure is 160, 80, that you should not worry. It's diastolic. It's why it is 160, 100, that you should start worrying. So whether it is systolic or diastolic, okay. both of them are associated with cardiovascular disease and either of them. So make sure that you use the complementary drugs like we have said, start with them, make sure that you're using the appropriate doses, adjust your doses appropriately. Um, somebody asked, why is the female cell associated with hypertension? I'm not sure we said that, but no, it was when we're talking about the, the Spanish study. Yes, the Spanish study. And we said in that case that females were shown in that study to be less adherent to their medication. medication. Um, and then we were saying that in Nigeria, we think that females are more adherent to medication in Nigeria. Then but the all out studies, I think when we're talking about patient characteristic too, female sex was there. It was based on finding from multi analysis of different studies. Yeah. That they found that female patients were likely to have resistant hypertension when compared to their male counterparts. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Olua, so we heard your presentation to the end. You're very fantastic. So we'll continue. Um, any questions for um, Sevier, please also put it in the box. Um, I presented on the co um, cover round, cover seal, cover seal, and cover round plus. Um, so that is that about female. So somebody said that um, sometimes reluctance to change dose of drugs when the patient BP seems to be poorly controlled is poor patient compliance. The fear will be that increasing medication in a patient who is not even compliant will result in hypertension. Um, this makes some doctors reluctant to change the drug doses between long appointments. So long appointments are not fixed. Um, shorten the appointment. So if you have a problem with somebody not well controlled, give a shorter appointment. One week, two weeks. Um, it must not give every patient in three months. I know sometimes uh, we are constrained by resources. You are the only hospital in an area and you have to, but in these particular patients, you need to now shorten that appointment. appointment. Explain to them why. Shorten the appointment and make sure that it is not about adherence. So you have talked to them about adherence. You have helped them with tools to be adherent. You have talked about lifestyle. And some of the things that help with adherence is to kind of make the patient to include it in a routine. Yes. So tell them to add it to something they normally do. So if they pray every morning, they should take it immediately after prayer. If they brush their teeth, they take it immediately after brushing their teeth. Something that they are sure that they do every day, they should attach their medication. Or now that we have smartphones, they should put a reminder. Now, when they've taken these blood pressures consistently for a period of time, you can now recheck. So give them two weeks shorter appointment before you start doing a longer appointment. It is also inappropriate to give a patient a long appointment of three months with an uncontrolled blood pressure, okay, no. whether it is compliance or not. So when it comes to 150, 160, and then you tell them to come back in three months, that is inappropriate. That three months time, you may not, the person may never come back. And when you call them, you will hear a different story. So um, I think that there should- other be. factors foiling the poor adherence should also be exploited. Be exploited. So maybe costs, maybe inappropriate dosing regimen. Um, that's why single daily dose is better. Is it asking the patient to use the drug in the morning, in the evening. So just identify all those factors and address them. And by the time you do good education, there's nobody that wants to die or have stroke. At all. So Dr. Akola Ole, our consultant physician dermatologist, talked about the fact that increased androgens or hypersensitivity to androgens um, could also be picked, especially in young adults. So they have increased androgens. And in women, you could have different hysteticism, increased hair, um, you know, um, and different other things. They could have changes in menstrual cycles. They could have problems with uh, fertility. So sometimes this could be a pointer to PCOS and other things that could also be playing a role in that. And he says he's asking um, how frequently you see spironolactin response. Typically, when we use it, it does work yes. quite a lot of times, especially in patients that you have narrowed that this is actually with hypertension. You have taken care of lifestyle, you have measured sure that proper doses and proper drug combination. Then you now 
um, and they are still you add for your laptop, you typically get a good response. Yes, not for your gets better. Somebody says, um, what can be done when blood sugar starts getting raised in the non diuretic or moderate or HCT? So, um, typically, um, if blood sugar, blood sugar is getting raised on moderate or HCT, you should consider going to indapamide. Yes, moderate HCT may be a little bit cheaper, um, but if you're having metabolic effects, indapamide essentially typically is said to have less metabolic effects. Not that it doesn't have, but that it yes. has less than moderate or HCT. As much as possible, try not to give one full tablet of HCT, of moderate, sorry. Moderate has 50 milligrams of, of yes, hydrochlorothiazide. Right. So in a black, giving ah. one full tablet of moderate chi, you should be really, really um, cautious about that. So our advice as a practice um, in Nigeria is that you should um, not give more than half a tablet of moderate. And if patient can afford it, you should consider indapamide instead of tyrosine. And most of the studies talk about using tyrosine like directly, just like the uh, Oluwa Somi has uh, alluded to in her presentation. So using tyrosine and uh, tyrosine like indapamide, and indapamide is very much available. Indapamide in combination with other ones too is quite available, like Oluwa Somi has said. Um, somebody said how poverty is an issue with many patients. How do we manage poor patients properly as required? Well. The answer, the, the treatment for poverty is money. <laughs> so, but besides that, uh, you have to get creative in your local environment. In the patients that are uh, poor, those are patients, you cannot afford drugs, you should be able to afford lifestyle. Yes. Cut down salt. Weight loss. Weight loss. Take exercise. Avoid smoking. Avoid smoking. So, people are poor, but they can afford smoke. Mm -hmm. They can afford um, um, alcohol. Uh, alcohol. Okay, so you should cut down, they should inform exercise. They should add vegetables and fruits to their diet. All of that will help so that you now have less um, drug body. Then look for perhaps consider generic medications yes, generic. and consider specialist advice. Sometimes it's cheaper to get specialist advice early. So specialists may, may be more costly initially, but we able to manage drugs a little bit better in such patients that may be um, less uh, privileged. Um, what are the commonest side effects of Coveram Plus? Oluwa um, Somi, that is over to you. Well, right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, when you say common side effects, like, uh, can you hear me? Yes, you can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. So, like, uh, like Dr. Seko mentioned now, indapamide is metabolically neutral for um, cover seal. It has the least incidence of cough. And then amlodipine, uh, the, the side effects of amlodipine most times is the ankle edema. So in the combination with cover seal, both the arteries and the veins are now dilated, and then you have it in combination with indapamide. So we can say that Coveram Plus is actually very tolerable for your patients. So yeah, I can say that, okay, we have the least incidence of cough because we have an ACI. Um, edema, Ankle edema is reduced by the combination with cover seal. And then the hydrochlorothiazide, the tazard like diuretic now, indapamide, is metabolically neutral. So I can actually, from my table, say that Coveram Plus will not actually give your patient side effects. So it is. Okay, so the other questions about uh, HMO coverage of the drugs and the cost and the availability of the drugs in the Nigeria okay. market. Can you answer okay, that? Okay, thank you. 10 seconds. Yes, yes. So presently, Coveram Plus or Coveram with Indapamide is on the NHIS list. So your patients who we are saying cannot afford, that were tagging poor, can actually pick from the NHIS pharmacy then it is read very much available in Nigeria. And I am very sure um, we're gonna get the attendance of every attendee. So we'll be able to reach out to everybody to make sure that you are closest to where both Coveram Plus, Coveram and Coverseal is very available in every, in every state in Nigeria. Have I answered okay, all the questions? Um, what do you ask? Is it okay to take the three blueprint measurements on the same arm and at the same sitting? 
And if so, what intervals between the measurements? Doctor okay. Olarikani, I think talking about home blood pressure. Yes, home blood pressure. Even in the office too, it is advised that you take at least two to three measurements. You can put between two to three minutes. Some some people say one minute, two minutes, but average of two minutes in between the readings. So, and like we said earlier, take three measurements and use the average of the last two. Yeah. That's your blood pressure. So, so sometimes patient has come in. Also, when patient comes to your, your consulting room, um, we typically are able to sit down for some time. Mm -hmm. Don't just go yes. and start taking blood pressure. Give them some time, talk, some take your history, patient is rested, then you can now go five, 10 minutes now. If you've been uh, practice for a while, you will realize that the first blood pressure, if you so take it, elevated. it's always elevated. If you do it a second time, it's normally a little bit less. Mm -hmm. So take two or three uh, at that time. And so if you say you want to take blood pressure, blood pressure is high, and you want to take a second one at another interval, make sure you're taking two or three. That first apprehension, the patient comes in mm -hmm. to take blood pressure. If you take it twice, you probably will get a better and more accurate, appropriate reading. And that helps with white coat hypertension. Sometimes yes. what I do is I put this cough on the patient and I continue talking with the patient. So the patient gets used to that cough before you now start um, checking the blood pressure. So that you don't just put it there. And you just start, <laughs> and, you know, distract exactly. Okay, so those are some things. I think we've answered almost oh, all the questions. Thank you, Oluwa Summit, for answering the questions relating to Coveram and, the, and um, severe drugs. Um, so once again, um, this presentation was from Cardio Care um, Hospital. And um, Cardio Care is here in Abuja. Um, what essentially we do is that we take care of a lot of um, cases of, of heart attacks, of stroke, of um, things like that. And, um, and um, um, cardiology, endocrinology. A lot of patients that have cases of um, myocardial infarction that have, um, and I'll show you a small video so that you can see how some of these interventional cases are treated um, in the hospital so that you can have an idea. It's really not that hard so that patients can actually be treated here in the country. Yes. And uh, that is something that we want everybody to know. Um, besides that, we also offer a lot of services in cardiology, endocrinology, stroke medicine, ICU care, and the like. And one of the things we'd like to do is that to tell you that, look, patients do not always have to go abroad uh, for treatment. Uh, and then this February, Cardio Care and Limi Hospital is 40 years in existence. 40 years in existence. So that's not a small thing. Um, so um we 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 would like you to just know that and, and as we <laughs> as we show other things okay so i will just show you what a career what a, what a what a a what they call that thing a coronary angel looks like so i think you can see that you can see that on your screen Okay. The video is not showing very well. Okay, so um, essentially, um, that is um, so that's what we do. Do um, you have anything to say, sir? Yes, apart from the coronary angiography, pathogenous uh, coronary intervention, we also do advanced management for patients with heart failure. Some of these patients might need pacemaker, might need yeah. cardio, cardiac resynchronization therapy. We also do a lot of peripheral angiography. For people with peripheral arterial disease, we have actually saved some limbs that have been condemned to amputation. And uh, so we just say that all these services are available. We are at your disposal. We talked about stress, stress ECG, stress echo, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, 24, 48 hours ultra ECG, all this we can do, um, spirometry, EEG. So, Anytime you need any of these um, any of these services, you can contact us, and we try to establish a relationship with every doctor that sent patient to us. You get a feedback from us about your patient, what we did, the result of the investigation, and you can continue the management of your patient after each of this uh, procedure.
Thank you very much. Okay, so um, next, uh, in two weeks time, our children hospital will be having a um, presentation and um, in a month we'll come back also. Remember that you can have access to this webinar on our YouTube channel. So you can go to our YouTube channel. This webinar that we have done will be there and all the previous webinars will also be there. We'll also send to you um, the slide via email to your email addresses and doctors, for those that have that spent a significant amount of time, not those that spent five minutes and signed out. So for those that spent that amount of time, you will get your CME points uh, mailed to you as well. Um, give about uh, one one week to ten days to get your CME points, and then if you don't, uh, and then of course you can go to our YouTube channel. If you go to our website, CardioCare, the same place that you used to register, CardioCare.ng slash webinars, you will see all the previous webinars. We've talked about how to read an ECG. We've talked about how to manage pregnancy, diabetes. We've talked about chest pain management, heart attacks. We've talked about so many things, peripheral artery disease. You know, we've talked about a lot of these things. So it's quite, a, it's quite a good opportunity for you to be able to just go there and then um, have all of that. So from all of us at Cardio Care and Living Hospitals, why is our 48th year? Uh, we want to thank you for joining us. And uh, thanks to Sergey. Uh, Lua Somi, thank you very much for also, um, you know, capping up the presentation with, um, what you talked about and then survey has partnered with us and sometimes partners with us to bring this to a lot of people so today we've had over 130 or so people joining us yes. from different parts of the country i want to thank you all for joining and then thank you for uh what we expect to be an improvement in patient care i think we'll be able to answer all your questions if you still have questions and you watch it online don't hesitate to send a mail to cardiocaresymposia at gmail.com. Then our WhatsApp group is yes, also active. Yes, our WhatsApp group is active. We will send you a link um, as to how to join the WhatsApp group so that if you have a question, you can also ask questions directly. Of course, we do not consult over the phone, we do not consult over WhatsApp, but we can discuss doctor to doctor, but not patient to doctor, except under very critical scenarios. So um, that is also quite important for us. Um, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we'll be um, <coughs> ending the presentation right now. Um, if there are no more questions, um, I can see quite a number of people. So if there are no more questions, we'll be ending the presentation. Uh, Thank right you now. very much. Have a nice weekend. OK. So I will just be showing some videos of what we have done before. I hope I can find them. Right, thank you. Um, have a nice weekend and bring down all the blood pressures. <laughs> Safely. Safely. Thank you. Safely. Thank you very much. Onua Somi, thank you too. Thank you, Dr. Iseko. Thank you, Dr. Laleko. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the opportunity too. All right, thank you very much. Everybody have a nice weekend. All right, bye. Great weekend.